Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Joan Woodward, and I'm honored to lead the Travelers Institute, which is the public policy division and educational arm of Travelers. Welcome to Wednesdays with Woodward, our webinar series where we convene leading experts for conversation about today's biggest challenges, personal and professional. So before we get started, I'd like to share our disclaimer about today's program. I'd also like to thank our webinar partners today, the American Property Casualty Insurance Association, the Metro Hartford Alliance, the Risk and Uncertainty Management Center at the University of South Carolina's Darla Moore School of Business, and the Insurance Association of Connecticut. So thank you all. Now onto our program. Let's face it, everyone. The insurance industry can be very complex. The laws and regulations governing insurance differ depending upon the state or territory you're doing business in which can make it very difficult to stay on top of all the challenging trends, the innovations and challenges facing carriers today, producers and customers. So to help you make sense of the current regulatory landscape and the latest debates going on in state capitals and the US uh, Congress, I'm thrilled to be joined today by Michael Considine. Mike is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Association of Insurance Com Commissioners or NAIC. The NAIC is a US-based standard setting organization governed by the chief insurance regulators from all 50 states, the District of Columbia and US territories that coordinates the regulation of multi-state insurers. The NAIC brings together regulators to discuss industry trends, develop model legislation and regulations, and really to foster dialogue among stakeholder groups. So Mike and I are gonna take you inside the thinking at the NAIC and explore what regulators consider when deciding rates, coverages, and new products. We're also gonna discuss the key challenges and opportunities insurance regulators are facing today, and there's a lot of them, both at the state and federal levels, and really explore the workforce challenges facing the insurance departments following the pandemic. As CEO, Mike focuses on strategic planning, policy development, and implementation in the areas of state, federal and international affairs and relations. Mike has spent his entire career in the insurance industry as an attorney and a regulator. Most notably, he served as the insurance commissioner for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania from 2011 to 2015. So Mike, welcome to our webinar. Really great to see you today. John, it's great to, to be joining you here as well. Really look forward to our conversation. All right, so let's get started. So give us a bit of background, um, you know, first on yourself um, and leading the organization. It's a large organization and the mission of the NIC. Yeah, I'd be happy to, John, because the NAIC is really uh, an interesting and important organization when it comes to our state-based insurance system. Um, and it, it is a lot of things, and, and probably it's important to start with what it's not. It is not a government uh, or state agency. It is uh, formed back in 1871 as a membership organization, really designed at that point to start to pull together uh, our burgeoning state-based system of, of insurance. And really, that is where we have our roots in, in terms of a, as a member services organization organization really there to coordinate uh, the activities of state insurance regulators across 50 states and six territories. Um, beyond that, though, we serve a couple other really important functions, uh, one of which is as a standard setter. So we are not a state legislature or Congress or anything like that. So we don't pass formal rules and regulations, but we do pass uh, and enact model laws, regulations, bulletins, uh, through our members. And then those uh, model laws, bulletins are taken back to the states for enactment. And as I think we'll get into in a little bit more detail, that's been really important for purposes of setting up some uniformity uh, between the states and how they regulate companies, producers, all aspects of the insurance sector. Um, and then beyond being a standard setter and sort of a membership organization, we also are, in many respects, a technology company. Uh, the NEIC um, collects a wealth of insurance and financial data. In fact, I think we are the largest repository 
of insurance sector data uh, in the US, if not the world, when it comes especially to the US insurance market, both from a financial standpoint, market conduct standpoint, producer licensing, the list goes on and on. Uh, we use that data and related technology to support our members. So we're essentially the back office for the state insurance departments across the country. If you are making files, filings of any type, if you're applying for a license, if you're uh, doing anything generally related to, to insurance, um, very likely that, that the states are utilizing uh, platforms that we develop and maintain on their behalf, again, in an effort to really have that coordination and uniformity between states. We move on to the, the next slide there. Um, and our focus of our members is really, again, is their state-based system. And we'll talk more about what that means is focusing on their consumers and their markets. Um, the US is incredibly unique in how we do insurance. It's a state-based system, meaning each state has a regulator that is in charge of regulating her, his marketplace, uh, and the companies that do business there, both on a domestic and, and foreign basis. And their singular focus is, is on that marketplace, being both the companies and particularly the consumers and protecting them. And the NEIC's mission really is to, to back up that mission of our members. We we're, we're really take a great deal of pride in supporting our members in the incredibly important work that they do. As you mentioned, Joe, and I had the privilege of serving uh, as a state insurance uh, commissioner for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for about five years. And uh, I really didn't have an appreciation for, full appreciation for the work that state insurance regulators do until I had the opportunity to, to be in that role. And uh, it is incredible the impact that they have on everyday Americans. Uh, and it is, again, a real privilege for all of us at the NEAC to support them. Uh, if we can move on. What you have here is um, when I talk about us being a member organization, a member driven organization, that's really important to, to us, our culture. Uh, every one of the 56 state insurance, territory insurance regulators across the country is an NEIC member. They are all incredibly personally involved in the development of our models in discussing uh, policy and coordinating their activity. Uh, hopefully some of you have had the opportunity to go to one of our national meetings and have seen uh, the work of these amazing people uh, that they do in, in a very transparent, very open environment. Uh, something else that we take a great deal of pride is how open we are in terms of uh, what we do in the insurance sector, how we develop uh, our models, how we develop our policies. Uh, we, we really are inclusive in terms of getting the views of all of our stakeholders, consumers, companies, producers, et cetera. Um, we are led by a, a group of uh, officers and you have our current 2023 officers in, in front of you. Uh, it's a diverse group um, in every respect. And I think, again, that is one of the great strengths of our organization is we have members from all across the country, all different political geographic backgrounds, uh, and they bring that unique perspective to this you know, great table that we all get to sit at. And I think that provides and allows us to have a stronger state-based system when you have all of these perspectives uh, being presented, being heard, sometimes even being challenged. Uh, but I think that is, for us, I think one of the great strengths of, of a state-based system is you get 56 different voices and views, and it's not just a singular one-size-fits-all sort of uh, mentality. So uh, I have the privilege of working with each of these individuals and, and the 50 two other members that we have who are all leaders in, in their own right for, for the year. So Jonah, hopefully that gives you a little bit. I know we'll get to go into some more detail in each of the, in some of these areas and look forward to, to discussing sort of our, our mission and our members and, and some, some more detail here. No, that's great. I appreciate the overview because uh, not a lot of us uh, maybe on this call clearly understand what it is and what it's not. And so it's, it's great to hear, uh, hear from you. Um, all right, at this moment, I'd like to turn the tables on our audience, as everyone knows, and ask you a audience polling question. And so we only have one today, and this is really to inform our discussion. Uh, and so we can dig deep or uh, stay a little bit higher level. How familiar are you with the regulatory framework around the insurance industry? So um, are you a newbie to our industry and you need to know from the ground up, or are you a long time uh, insurance professionals. So as I would have imagined, Mike, uh, a lot of people are somewhat familiar 
uh, looks like with uh, some of the regulatory framework and structure. Uh, we have several that are very familiar, so that's good. We have very, very sophisticated people in the insurance industry here. And we have some people that are new, maybe, to the industry. So, you know, generally speaking, um, the insurance, as we said, is a state level uh, regulatory. How is it different uh, here in the United States versus, for example, the framework that is currently in play in Europe? Yeah, so again, I keep making reference to our state-based system, um, which means insurance is regulated at a state level. Uh, and that makes us, that does make us unique as compared to a lot of other jurisdictions. Uh, for example, Europe and Europe, they have mostly centralized uh, insurance regulation, both at the country level and then at the European uh, Union level, there's also kind of a central insurance regulator. Um, that is replicated in probably most countries. And as we'll talk a little bit about, we are actively involved at an international level with our counterparts. Inter insurance is a global business these days, so we have to kind of coordinate our activities. So when we're at those international tables, typically we're sitting across from sort of a, a central regulator for, for insurance. I think there are definitely pros and cons uh, about that approach. Uh, as I talked a little bit about at the intro, we think there's a great deal of strength coming from a diversity of thought, diversity of viewpoint. You know, and our system here in the U.S. is really kind of a byproduct of our unique American history, uh, culture, uh, congressional and judicial actions. Um, I mentioned we were formed back in 1871, and that was shortly after a couple Supreme Court uh, cases, which uh, upheld, again, that sort of insurance uh, was a, it, and should be viewed as a state-based activity. Um, and then that was further affirmed um, by Congress uh, in the McCarran-Ferguson Act. And you'll hear references to McCarran-Ferguson. And basically that just says, you know, insurance is, is left up to, to the states to regulate, um, you know, unless and otherwise Congress specifically uh, enacts regulation to the contrary. And so there are some areas where you do have a little bit of a federal overlay, particularly in the healthcare area, um, but there is no federal insurance regulator. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the activities of the Treasury Department and Federal Insurance Office, Federal Reserve and others, all of whom play kind of a role. But uh, if you, you know, I'm sitting here in D.C. and there is no, uh, you know, sort of federal agency that I would go to who is kind of there at a federal level overseeing insurance. Uh, and I think that has been, again, to our benefit. And as I also mentioned you know, it's, it's a byproduct of our geography. We, we keep a list around that shows the top, you know, 100 insurance markets in the world. And in the top five, 25, Joan, I think eight or nine of them are actual U.S. states. I mean, you think about states like California, Texas, Florida, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Uh, they're all global insurance markets. Um, and I think out of almost necessity require, you know, a state-based regulator. Uh, and those markets are unique from one another. What, you know, what the Oklahoma market is, is different from um, the Oregon insurance marketplace. Uh, and, and it's, again, I think a strength that we're able to tailor our regulation accordingly. We like to look at our, our state-based system as almost sort of laboratories yeah. of innovation and entrepreneurship. So it's, it's, it's worked out well for us so far. Well, that's great. Thank you for that. I, I do want to get into and talk about what happened during the great financial crisis, 2000, 2008, and 2009. Um, after the financial crisis, of course, a couple of insurance companies, you know, did take TARP uh, money. Um, so the federal government, Congress created this federal insurance office at Treasury, which was, you know, established during the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010. So what does that office actually do? Because as you said, there's no federal insurance regulator. What role does that federal insurance office play now? Um, and how do you see that's benefiting uh, the state-based -based regulatory system? Yeah, so as you said, uh, you know, the, the FIO was created uh, post Dodd-Frank, and there was a lot of debate over what it should be. I mean, it went as far in some cases to suggest maybe we should look at a, you know, almost a quasi-federal uh, regulator, and there were others who even questioned the need for a federal insurance office. So uh, they ended up somewhere in, in the middle with an office that it serves a couple important functions, uh, at least for, for the federal government. One is it is there to represent uh, the federal government. Um, 
at an international level on insurance issues. Uh, again, uh, our members are represent their states and represent our state-based system. So we need somebody at the table to kind of represent the US um, uh, at, 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 from a federal perspective and, and they do that. So you'll hear occasionally uh, references to Team USA, which is basically uh, the NAIC membership, uh, the Federal Reserve and the FIO office, all of whom coordinate when it comes to representing US activities and US perspectives globally. FIO also has uh, some limited data collection uh, uh, ability. Uh, they generally have to work through the states uh, before they collect data directly from companies, but that's uh, occurred mostly in responses to natural catastrophes. You know, they're looking at it from kind of a systemic uh, standpoint. Uh, they uh, also issue the occasional report on, and from a, a market uh, perspective, uh, which we work with them on, on some of those as well. Currently, they're working on, I think, some, some reports related to uh, climate risk, uh, obviously an important issue, as well as um, automobile affordability and accessibility for uh, in the insurance side. So that covers it. Uh, again, they are not uh, a regulator. Um, uh, that's very clear in, in Dodd-Frank, uh, but they do serve uh, a couple of important roles from a federal government. Okay, thank you for that. So that's the Treasury Department and Office of Insurance. Let's talk about the Federal Reserve, because when we talk about Federal Reserve, a lot of people just think monetary policy. But a few weeks ago, I interviewed Dr. Bob Hartwig, who of course is a legend in, in this industry. And he sure. was just appointed to that new, the Federal, uh, you know, Federal Reserve Advisory Board on Insurance. So what does the Fed do uh, in terms of oversight of the whole industry? Yeah, so uh, the, the Fed has a, a uh, you know, a little bit more substantive role in, in, in that they actually do have some regulatory oversight when it comes to company insurance companies that also own uh, bank and thrift institutions. That is where their uh, jurisdictions come to play. It's not to the exclusion of state insurance regulators. It's, it's in addition to state insurance regulators. So we work closely with, with them uh, when it comes to those companies. Um, they were had significantly more authority in the immediate aftermath of, of uh, the last financial crisis when we had uh, domestic, you know, too big to fail companies, the SIFI list, and there were about four or five insurance, uh, large insurance companies that were designated uh, as as uh, significant uh, SIFIs. Um, we don't have those anymore. They were all basically. Uh, de-designated uh, and returned essentially to, to full, full state oversight. Uh, but the institution that was involved in that, which is called uh, FSOC, we have so many abbreviations and acronyms in, in our world, uh, as everybody appreciates, but FSOC, uh, again, is kind of a amalgamation of, of, of federal agencies, as well as having state, rep and state representatives on there looking at, at, again, the insurance and financial services sector from kind of a a macro prudential perspective from a systemic risk perspective. Uh, they continue to play a role on there. The Fed continues to play a role on there. And as you mentioned, you know, the Federal Reserve uh, it focuses mostly on monetary policy, but they're also looking at sort of this systemic risk issue. And so issues like climate uh, are increasingly important to, to them. Uh, but we have a, a great working relationship with the, the Federal Reserve. They've been uh, tremendous partners uh, in sort of a shared mission to ensure a very vibrant uh, and solvent insurance sector here in the U.S. Okay. I want to shift a little bit because the tech and the finance se sectors, you know, for example, uh, we've seen businesses and consumers really struggle to navigate the complex interplay between state and federal regulatory oversight. And so do you think the insurance sector is at risk of facing those kinds of challenges in the future? So I think when we're talking about those kinds of challenges, it's, you know, it's, it's probably talking about what's the risk of, again, having kind of a, uh, a shift towards federal regulation of, of insurance, potentially, uh, or again, you know, more federal engagement uh, in the insurance. And, you know, to, we, we have seen, obviously, kind of a creep of, of the federal government into insurance. I referenced early on sort of what happens in, in healthcare, um, which is, uh, again, you've got uh, HHS and CMS involved in, in some of those products. Um, but in terms of do I see, you know, Congress stepping in and say, hey, let's have a you know, optional federal charter or federal insurance regulator. 
I don't really think the appetite is there at a congressional level. I don't think the interest is there much at a insurance sector level as it maybe was at one point in, in the 90s and 2000s. Uh, I think some companies have gotten a, a little bit of a glimpse of that following the last financial following the last financial crisis when you did have some federal engagement and yeah. increase. And I think to some extent, you know, it made the case for for our state based system. Is is it perfect? No. Do we have uh, you know Do we have opportunities to continue to improve on things like uh, uniformity and speed to market? Absolutely. And I know we have a membership that understands. You know, it is uh, it it is a constantly shifting policy landscape. And just because you know we we you know don't see the threat of federal regulation right now doesn't mean we get to you know rest on our laurels and do nothing. I think uh, our our membership, our officers uh, for the past few years have been very committed to leading the way on a number of issues that I know we'll get a chance to talk about. Okay, so you mentioned Congress. We have a new Congress, new leadership, uh, you know, installed. So what legislative proposals do you see on the horizon in Congress? I mean, obviously, they've, they've worked very hard on the National Flood Insurance Program and in TRIA, the Terrorism Risk Insurance Programs. But what, if any, do you see any federal uh, legislation in the next, you know, say 18 months? And what about the state uh, in terms of any major uh, regulation changes in the state levels? Yeah, the congressional dynamic is, is going to be a really interesting one. I mean, I think for the last few years, just because of, you know, kind of the, the power sharing shifting that we've seen, it's been very hard to get uh, meaningful, comprehensive legislation of any type through through Congress. It is, you know, there is there is gridlock. It definitely has affected all sectors, uh, insurance in, included. So, you know, I think getting something like a Dodd-Frank Act through right now would be very, very challenging uh, just because of the, the political divisions that we have in Congress. That's not to say though, Joan, you know, there, there could not be sort of a, a weird collision of interest on issues, for example, like big data or cybersecurity, things that frankly transcend just the insurance sector. I know uh, you're seeing kind of an interesting coalition of, of, of interests and members around, as I said, you know, more regulation of, of big data and data privacy. That's not an insurance specific issue, but you know, it's very likely that the insurance sector it could get caught up in, in something like that. So you know, we're in very involved in reminding um, members of Congress, particularly new ones who don't understand, you know, may not be as aware of the system again, that we have a, a state-based system and that the insurance uh, regulators at the state level are probably in a very good position, even with things like data privacy to, to ensure that the enforcement is appropriate and that consumers are protected. You know, beyond that, um, I think we are watching mostly what's happening at an agency level. While there's probably not, not a huge likelihood that Congress is gonna do anything really, really huge uh, in the near future. Uh, I think this the, the Biden administration has empowered a lot of agencies to, to aggressively push the envelope when it comes to their own rulemaking uh, and pursuing sort of this administration's agenda when it comes to issues like climate risk and consumer protection. Um, so, you know, we're working very closely with, with federal agencies, most of whom we've got a good, really good working relationship with to, to make sure, again, that there is a balancing of interest and and, and in a recognition in that in many cases, we already have uh, you know, a state-based effort underway to address some of these issues. Okay, I wanna pivot a little bit uh, and talk about a really hot topic in our industry right now, risk-based pricing. So as you know, risk-based pricing is really considered to be a foundational pillar of the insurance industry. But there's recently been some pushback in recent years against this practice. So why is that? And what are you doing to kind of educate folks about the, the fundamental pillar of risk-based pricing in our, in our business? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, John, I, you know, I don't get a sense from our membership generally that anybody is pushing back on fundamental, the fundamental underpinnings of, of insurance in terms of uh, you know, it being a, a risk-based product. That is the very nature of insurance. I mean, it's, I've had to sit in front of, you know, Congress as part of testimony and explain why, you know, essentially discrimination, fair discrimination is part of the business model for, for insurance. We have a lot of laws on the books that prevent things like unfair discrimination, but, you know, at its heart, insurance is about, you know, risk and, and discriminating to some extent between good risks and bad risks. 
but there is, I think it's fair to say, a deeper look at how insurance companies and related entities go about applying uh, you know, risk-based practices uh, in ways that may you know, impact uh, protected groups uh, more than others. And I think that's a concern. You know, so you have had some members, not at a national level, look at things like credit scoring and whether or not you know, credit scoring has uh, you know, more of an impact on certain, again, protected classes than, than others. Um, and, you know, and there have been state-based active actions uh, you know, taken in, in response. I think the more data, the more information we get, um, the more transparent the, the industry is, the more educated and informed uh, our membership is in, is, in, is in making decisions about sort of risk-based pra practices and pricing going forward. But there is no move away from that. I mean, it, it, you couldn't. I mean, that would basically turn insurance on, on its head. But I think there is a sensitivity to, particularly as we're using more and more sophisticated you know, black box, uh, you know, big data-driven models to make sure that there isn't something happening in the background there that, uh, as I said, is, is kind of resulting in uh, you know, unintended proxy discrimination against protected classes. So, so actually on that point, so what steps are the NAIC or regulators taking to ensure the customers really are being treated fairly and equitably in, in the underwriting process? And I know this is, you know, a, a, a really important topic and I, we want to make sure we hear your thoughts on this because um, there is a role to play, right? To make sure people are treated fairly. Yeah, so I think, as I said, this, this is playing out most visibly when it comes to, you know, companies' uh, use of uh, big data, you know, um, um, quasi AI type uh, black box algorithmic approaches to um, underwriting and rating. And uh, we've had, I think, what has been a, a very constructive uh, discussion and debate at an NEIC level in a very transparent manner uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, in fact, we formed for the first time, I think 50 years, a new letter committee. So most we work through a series of committees, each kind of focused on a particular uh, aspect of, of the insurance industry. And we formed our H committee, which is kind of cross-sectoral in its focus on uh, data technology and cybersecurity. And it's led by, been led the last couple of years by Commissioner Kathleen Borain out of Maryland, who's done a masterful job of engaging the stakeholder community and understanding both the benefits of using this kind of technology, the efficiencies it achieves, you know, potentially getting to underserved communities, but also the risks, as I said, in terms of you know potentially impacting um, you know protected classes. So um, I, it was in our last national meeting. I think we're going to move forward from sort of these principles we've developed to more of a, potentially a model bulletin of some type, which will provide guidance to the insurance sector on how to use uh, these models in an appropriate ethical manner uh, so that we don't uh, you know, have sort of this unintended consequences. But I think our approach is one that is principle-based. It's not highly prescriptive. It's certainly not designed to quash innovation uh, in, in the sector. Uh, that's something that we think has significant pro-consumer benefits if done correctly. But we have to balance that against the consumer protection interests uh, that our members have, um, you know, particularly given that we do have uh, an affordability and accessibility crisis still in this country when it comes to a lot of, you know, of insurance-based risks. Uh, and that, again, is something that is, is of, of great importance and concern to our membership. Wonderful. Thank you for that. It's really good to hear and good to know that all that work is being done behind the scenes. So thank you. Um, I want to shift now and talk about the insurance departments themselves, because as you all know out there, all the employment changes, the worker shortages, the, the labor force shortages right now, um, from an employment perspective, post-COVID, um, a lot of, we've had a lot of early retirements, career changes across the board in our industry, across all industries because of COVID. So how are the departments impacted uh, by this specifically? Is there, um, is there churn among the departments or does it vary by state? What are you seeing across the board? 
Yeah, I mean, this is one of those issues that um, you know, as a CEO, keeps me up at night. Not just uh, for for the you know the sake of the NEIC, and we've had sort of we faced a lot of the same pressures that all employers have faced. But the same is true of our our departments as well. I mean, you know, the backbone of our state based system are the you know women and men who are serving in those departments and you know protecting consumers and monitoring companies and you know it is uh, an area that requires you know in many cases a fair amount of uh, expertise and skills increasingly you know we're looking at, like everybody else with at people with technology backgrounds with analytical backgrounds you know even data you know scientists type backgrounds in some cases so it's tough enough to compete for talent, uh, you know, even in the pre-pandemic market. Now, of course, as you're dealing with the great resignation and quiet quitting and everything else that's happening, uh, yeah, it is. It is having an impact on on our departments and on our members, just as it is on in, in every employer. Uh, and I think to to their credit, uh, you know, from what I'm hearing from our members, and you know, they're working with their their governors, um, to, you know, where where they're not elected uh, to to kind of start doing the same out of the box thinking that every employer is having to do to keep, retain and attract uh, talent. Um, one of the great benefits I think we have uh, generally, and this is not just for the government, but I think as a sector is the value proposition of insurance. And, um, you know, we had uh, last year, uh, Director Dean Cameron, who was uh, our president last year, passionate guy, uh, been involved in insurance his whole life and just feels deeply about how important insurance is to everyday Americans and protecting them and, and their families. And, you know, we, we need to do a better job across the board and government included about selling the value proposition of being part of an industry there that is there to protect Americans uh, and, and the privilege that we have at a state level in being involved in developing policies and taking actions that allow us to do that as a sector. So um, I think there is an opportunity for us to, to up our game when it comes to making the case for what we do and how we do it. Um, and, you know, and that I think in addition to workforce policies that we're all still struggling with in terms of allowing more flexibility and working uh, on a hybrid fashion. Um, but uh, yeah, this is something that we're all going to have to, to watch play out over the next few years because there is an enormous uh, talent gap uh, that exists in the, in the marketplace already and, and one that we as a sector have to be very focused on. Yeah, and if, if as you know, if the insurance departments aren't properly staffed with individuals that are skilled, have the right skills, just like in any business, um, I mean, this could be a real, a real difficult problem for you know, the agent broker community, for the carrier community, and for the consumers. So what are you guys doing? I mean, we hear a lot from our agent brokers about attracting new talent, and they want to know what strategies are you employing uh, to get that new talent, that younger generation in our industry? Have you found any, any magic bullet there, or uh, are you recruiting at different schools around the country? There's a lot of risk management schools out there. Uh, luckily for us, that we tap in uh, as well. So what is there anything that you can share with us in terms of getting, not just getting young people to come to our industry, but having them stay in our industry? Yeah. Um, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's a real issue for all of us. Yeah, no. Well, I think one of the proudest accomplishments we have coming out of last year was the, the NEIC formed the NEIC Foundation, which is which was created specifically to attract talent and talent from uh, underserved communities into the insurance sector. Uh, it's still in its launch phase. We've got three great uh, directors who are uh, outside uh, directors who are leading us efforts, uh, former NEIC members, uh, Terry Vaughn, George Nichols, and Ray Farmer, uh, all who are, again are passionate about this issue recognize the need. And I think for us, as you said, there's no silver bullet here. There's, you know, maybe silver, a bunch of silver BBs that we can kind of combine to achieve the same effect. But one is getting in early to, you know, high schools and communities and, and providing opportunities uh, to come work in the sector. So I know the NASC Foundation is are, are looking at sort of mentorship um, opportunities, uh, internship opportunities, uh, and that creates this pipeline. Uh, and sure, we're doing the same things in terms of being out at the schools, uh, at historically Black universities, 
really focusing on raising awareness about um, you know the community we serve, um, many of which they come from directly, and, and the opportunities in the insurance sector. And then, yeah, we have to you know once you get them get them in the pipeline, you have to figure out ways about retaining and elevating uh, the talent as they move through. Uh, so you know we're, we're continuing to work on how we're involved in this, but. I mean, for us, this is an area where we have uh, a collective in, in interest with the larger uh, sector, uh, and and we're you know looking at ways that in terms of how we can work with companies and universities, with uh, uh, you know consumer protection groups to uh, identify ways that we can work together to, to to meet this need. Because you're right, for us, it really is mission critical that we've got people doing these jobs to protect consumers, to protect our markets. If we don't, that's you know those are the fundamentals we absolutely have to, to get right to, to make the case for our state-based system. If we fail at that, then we end up making the case for some alternative approach, which I can guarantee you is not going to be probably in the best interests of Americans. Yeah, I um, you know here at the Travelers Institute, I, I think over the past fifteen years we've been to about ninety different universities, and that's actually the most energetic I am when I'm speaking to students about uh, the career. So um, thank you for that. We appreciate on behalf of the entire industry helping us bring more young folks in. Okay, now I want to shift and uh, talk about another really hot topic out there, which is cybersecurity. So we at the institute here at Travelers Institute do a lot of uh, symposiums, educational forums talking about cyber risk and cyber insurance and cyber hygiene for businesses. Uh, what are some of the issues that you're seeing out there now um, focused on the cyber space? I mean, some people are even saying cyber might not be insurable in, into the future. I mean, how are, how are the regulators thinking about uh, cyber insurance? Yeah, I think it is certainly a fair question. And, and we, have, uh, we have definitely seen a pullback in the you know, cyber insurance market from its launch, you know, maybe a decade or ago. Uh, you know, the products, I think appropriately so, are getting uh, much more tailored to, to kind of uh, capture and, and minimize that, uh, that risk that is uh, significant out there. I think more broadly, though, Joan, I mean, cyber is one of those, you know, I kind of have a short list of existential threats to, to our insurance sector and to our state-based system, things that, you know, if they go horribly, horribly wrong, uh, we're all in big trouble. And, you know, a massive, you know, cyber attack that, you know, impacts consumers from both an insurance perspective and impacts the industry directly is is it the, not at the top of my list, it's the top of a lot of people's uh, list who, who matter when it comes to looking at the insurance sector. So our membership is appropriately really focused on, as you said, you know, making sure that the insurance sector uh, is really on top of this issue. And having worked for you know, a global insurance company, I know it is you know, a top line discussion for most boards of directors and senior management, and it should be. I mean, yeah. we have seen the impact of, you know, uh, I, I isolated cyber attacks on specific companies and what it does to their uh, reputation, what it does to their consumers, um, and nobody wants to, to, to have that mess. Uh, but it is, you know, it is an ongoing, uh, in some cases, uphill battle, uh, you know, when you're looking at sort of the aggressors on, on the, the cyber attack side. And, and they have targeted the insurance sector as, you know, sort of a, a gold mine of information uh, that they can exploit. So I don't see any time in the near future where in the insurance uh, industry and insurance companies, large and small, and we are increasingly seeing small and mid-sized companies, you know, subject to ransomware and insurance uh, cyber uh, attacks. Um, so nobody is immune. Everybody should be prepared. Everybody should have absolute, you know, attention to this as, as, as I said, a top line issue. We have uh, developed a, a, a cybersecurity model at the NAIC about six years ago. I think about eh, close to 30 states have now adopted it. Uh, there's still more work to be done. Uh, I think this is an issue where everybody uh, should be on board with, you know, doing at least, you know, kind of a uh, more than a bare minimum, but uh, taking you know significant action to protect themselves, and really our model is, is there is to establish kind of a, a baseline uh, on a coordinated basis. And as I said, this uh, from an existential threat area is like if we don't get this right, I can assure you this would be an area where the federal government would maybe appropriately so step in if we're not able to regulate uh, this aspect and this risk 
uh, appropriately. Okay, we're gonna stay tuned on that for sure. Uh, another technology question for you. Uh, we're hearing a lot about blockchain technology and its potential applications uh, in our industry. So what is the NAIC doing um, you know, on blockchain? Yeah, so I mean, you know, Blockchain, that was one of those words you had to kind of, you know, if you were cool, you had to work into at least a, a, every presentation for, for, a few, for a few years, I think. I still think it has a, uh, a ton of uh, potential application. Um, to be honest, though, you know, from a regulatory standpoint, we have not, uh, you know, seen sort of an application yet that I think demonstrates the, the potential that has been, you know, promised out, out there. Um, that's not to say, though, that uh, you know we aren't interested in looking at emerging technologies, you know, like blockchain and smart analytics uh, to to you know make the sector more streamlined, to make it more efficient. Um, you know, the issue with with blockchain, frankly, is probably more um, on the the company side. It seems to to really be effectively launched because it requires a lot of transparency, a lot of openness to sharing information across the, the blockchain. And, uh, you know, I think we've seen some resistance to that. And I think, um, you know, we're, we are open to its applications and potentials on a regulatory side. But uh, I think there are still some pilot projects out there that we're kind of watching and evaluating to see how they, they pan out and how, what the potential applications are to uh, to the insurance sector, though, but I mean, from a broader perspective, uh, you know, are we looking at kind of reg tech and emerging technologies uh, that could make insurance regulation um, more efficient, smarter, better? Absolutely, we are. It's a big part of, as I said, as a technology company, um, we've got a, a CTO who is, uh, you know, out there on the cutting edge when it comes to data analytics and empowering our members to be able to, to look at their markets, to look at what's happening you know, in their markets and with their consumers, not just from a real-time perspective, but from a predictive perspective. And you know, that's, I think that's the future for us. And again, harnessing that technology is a big part of how we stay competitive as a state-based system. Okay, I wanna take a bunch of uh, audience questions. So drop them in the Q&A if you have a question for Mike. Uh, first one's gonna be just about back on technology. Um, what are you thinking about uh, artificial intelligence and this new chat GPT technology? Do you see applications for us in the insurance industry? Is it, uh, are the opportunities or are they scaring you? You know, I, I, um, I got to play around with chat GPT pretty early on after its launch about six months ago. And um, it's a game changer, John. I think it's not just for, for the insurance sector, but its ability to uh, create content almost instantaneously uh, is pretty awe-inspiring, all, all, you know, if not terrifying at, at times. And yeah, I, I've had it, you know, write speeches and you know, and do analytical pieces. The accuracy of which you have to really know, you know, your, you know, sort of the subject matter to be able to question because of gen what it generates is, is, you know, pretty impressive, as I said. So I think some, you know, it, it does have the ability to be, you know, fairly transformative, particularly, you know, when it comes to product design, um, you know, sort of consumer facing materials, even analytical pieces. I, I see you've got an upcoming uh, sort of uh, session on chat GPT. I'll probably tune in for that one because I, I think we're just starting to understand the potential for almost near AI platforms uh, like that one. And everybody's racing to sort of create what comes next. And we'll have application in the insurance sector and on the regulatory sector uh, that could be helpful. And again, sort of a speed to market and efficiency standpoint. Absolutely. And are we already, you know, we're already using sort of platforms like that, that can analyze product filings that took, you know, sort of a policy analyst, maybe a week or two to compare dozens of filings against each other, identify the differences, uh, you know, sort of provide an, you know, an analysis of what those differences mean. They can do, the, you know, we've seen products that can do that instantaneously. And, and I think for our members, you know, that has a potential to, to again, make regulation more efficient and faster. Well, first, thank you for giving us an advertisement uh, because yeah. we are going to have our internal travelers data scientists 
on uh, March 1st, and we're going to have a whole session on chat GPT. See, we, we read your surveys. When you fill them out and you tell us what you want to hear, we put it on the agenda. So thank you for that shout out. Okay, another question for you, Mike. This is a good one from Stephen Simchak. Um, oh, hi, Steve. <laughs> going from PA commissioner to president of the NEIC, what surprised you most? Oh, gosh. Um, I guess probably, um, you know, I thought as uh, there's, there's kind of an evolution as an NEIC member that you come to understand the breadth and scope of NEIC services and what we do to support our state-based system. I, I worked first as an attorney at the Pennsylvania Insurance Department, had some peripheral familiarity with the NASD, kind of thought it was mostly, as I said, sort of on the standard setting side. You know, as commissioner and, and also as an NEIC officer, you know, I, I came to an even greater understanding, again, of how the organization supported our state-based system. But it really wasn't until I got into this job and got to work, you know, with the amazing team that we have at the NEIC. We have a little over 500 employees in three offices in Kansas City, uh, D.C., where I am today, and uh, New York. Um, all of whom have different areas of expertise. But uh, really, when I started and just learned, again, though how we essentially are the back office for, for insurance, all of the different training uh, programs that we offer, you know, not just on traditional insurance stuff, but you know, how to use social media and you know, things like that. Um, you know, what we do when it comes to capital markets, the wealth of abilities that our New York team has to understand what's happening on Wall Street, I, I, it's just... It's breathtaking the expertise that this organization has to support our membership and is really, you know, uh, an amazing asset for, for all of us. Yeah, we see it firsthand. So you, you've assembled quite the team, really, uh, and we benefit from that tremendously. Okay, another question coming in from Terry Buckner. Is there appetite to support a national license option for brokers rather than have 50 states uh, to do this separately? And we've got this question uh, a number of times today. So <laughs> talk about why not have a national licensing program? Uh, well, uh, there, there's one actually in the works, uh, which is uh, NARAB. So um, uh, which is, a, again, sort of a federal level uh, mechanism through which producers will be able to get a uh, multi-state license. Um, NEIC supported the formation of, of NARAB. Uh, the issue is still with uh, the administration um, and, and to some extent uh, treasury to get it off the ground. Uh, and so there, there is legislation, um, or not, there's, there's a law in the book that uh, would form, that, that forms NARAB, but they actually have to constitute it, its board of directors, and get the thing off the ground. And once it is, uh, then there will be this mechanism, and it will feed directly into our current state-based systems for licensing purposes. So write your congressmen and encourage, uh, you know, the Treasury Department and the administration to, to move forward with, with getting NARAB up and running. And we at the NEIC, you know, once that they take that action, uh, certainly will lend, uh, you know, our support to uh, having some of our members serve on the board and, and getting this thing going. Okay. A uh, number of questions coming in about California. So why is California so different when it comes to regulation and why are they uh, so slow to approve rate filings lately? <laughs> A lot of questions yeah. on that one, Mike. Yeah, well, uh, and I'm certainly not going to opine on sort of our individual uh, members uh, other than to say, I, you know, uh, I know each one of them is committed to their to their markets uh, and to protecting consumers and doing what they believe is is the right thing for, for, for their marketplace. Um, you know, I work closely with uh, Commissioner Laura, uh, and I know he is passionate about the insurance sector. Um, California, like many areas of the country, uh, I think is facing, as I said, kind of is on the front lines of this affordability and accessibility issue. Uh, my home state of Colorado also not immune to it and driven by a lot of climate related risks. And that is something I think, you know, they're, they're working through because, um, you know, as I said, that is also one of those existential threats to our entire sector. If we have companies only writing the very best of business and, you know, um, sort of the, the cherry picking kind of approach and not using traditional concepts like risk pooling and risk sharing. And, and, and now we do have the ability at the company level to, you know, underwrite and rate risk at sort of the individual uh, risk level and not sort of do it from a risk pooling standpoint. You know, we're seeing more and more areas of the country where people can't find 
automobile insurance or can't find homeowners insurance or can't find it cheaply. And I think that is in the backdrop of a lot of these issues that uh, our members are, are grappling with. Okay, thank you for that. Another question coming in from Brenton Slutsky. How do we make suggestions to the NAIC, particularly with regards to the transportation network company? What is the transportation network company and how do they make suggestions to you? Uh, so I think TNC is, I mean, this is kind of the, the Ubers and Lyfts of, of, of the world. Um, and we actually were very engaged on this issue probably about five years ago when there were a lot of questions being raised about coverage gaps and, you know, sort of risks to consumers. Uh, and we took action at that point to, again, sort of suggest, I think, either a model law that uh, ultimately a number of states did uh, pass that addressed, again, I think more consumer notice and uh, addressing sort of this gap issue. But with regard to the question about sort of how do you get engaged, uh, you know, one of the things we are most proud about at the NASC is sort of the openness and transparency of our process and the accessibility, the availability of our of our members. Um, so, you know, these national meetings are a great opportunity to raise these kind of issues or raise them directly, you know, with your state insurance department. I know as commissioner, I, I, I took a great deal of pride in, you know, hearing from consumers and, and at all sort of levels and understanding what their issues were and allowing us to, to bring them to sort of a national discussion table, which is what the NAIC is all about. Okay, um, another question coming in. What are the top three things that the industry players, the carriers or agencies can do to help state regulators ensure that level playing field? What are the things that we could ask of people on this call today, what would you yeah. like to see more of? Well, I, I just touched on one of them, which is engagement. I mean, again, make your voices heard. We, uh, you know, it is the strength of the state-based system that we we hear all voices before we make decisions, and that allows us to make informed decisions. So, engagement, uh, either directly or through your trades or through your companies, is is, one, is certainly something you know uh, uh, that we would would ask. It's easy to complain, but you know there are lots of opportunities to to get involved and and make your voice heard and ultimately make a difference. I'd also say you know education. Uh, I've talked a couple times you know during our conversation, John, about how we have as an organization have benefited from hearing from the industry on what they're doing on things like AI or what they're doing when it comes to certain product designs. You know, we are out there as advocates a lot uh, for our state-based system, but also for our insurance sector. And so the more we know as, uh, and that our, our members know as regulators, uh, the better we are able to address, you know, sort of the emerging issues and practices uh, and, and make informed decisions. And then probably the, the last thing I think is just, you know, sort of the shared commitment to, you uh, consumers and protection. I mean, as, as I said, I, I personally am passionate, I know many of our members are passionate about the work we do in the insurance sector, what you know, everybody on this call does to serve consumers. And I think if we sh have that shared commitment that you know, we are here to protect American families, um, you know, that, is a, that is something that is a strength for, for all of us. And if we can all get around you know, that as a foundational part of what we're doing here, uh, I think we can make a lot of progress on these issues. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for that. Another question coming in from Daryl Seif. Please comment on the current health of and the future plans for the surplus lines platform. Yeah, um, there's there's a lot involved in, in surpl surplus lines, you know, and again, uh, these are generally products that you can't uh, find on, on the traditional uh, insurance market. Um, yeah, and, and increasingly, I think there's there's a need uh, for that. If you can't find it through the traditional marketplace, you've got to go through the surplus lines marketplace. And you know there are um, you know that's that's the regulation there is a little bit differently, recognizing again sort of they're not traditional markets. Um, but I, I guess my one observation uh, would be going back to the concern that I think some of our members have is the more consumers have to go to sort of platforms outside of the traditional market for their, you know, for their needs to be protected, be it surplus lines or government programs. I think the more attention we are going to get appropriately so maybe from people like you know, people in Congress and elsewhere as to, well, if the insurance sector isn't doing this job anymore, what are they doing and why do we need them? So, um, 
so maybe a little bit of a soapbox moment there on, on, a, on, a, on a more general question, but uh, you know, that is something that I think we all have to be very, very cognizant about. Okay, another good question coming in. Thank you for that. Uh, from Deb Hagen, Deb wants to know, how do you believe the insurance industry will regulate more driverless cars and trucks? So autonomous vehicles, right? We've been yeah. waiting for them to come online for, mm -hmm. we've talked about them for the last you know, five, seven years. Um, what's the insurance industry regulatory structure? So what should it look like? Any different? Yeah, um, probably different. Um, how different and what it's going to look like? You know, uh, I, I think that's another area where, where we get to have a, a very good discussion uh, with everybody involved to figure that out. Um, you know, we're, see, we're already seeing, for example, the Teslas of the world, you know, essentially acting as their own insurance companies for, for their vehicles and the viewpoint that, you know, truly driverless cars don't require insurance as much as they do maybe a, a warranty type product. Do our members uh, necessarily agree with that? Uh, probably not. Uh, but, you know, we're not quite there yet, which I think is probably a, a good thing because I think we're going to need, you know, some time as we see that emerging more and more to, to figure it out. Okay, another question coming in from Charles Boychenko. What differences do you notice when working with elected insurance commissioners versus appointed ones? Is there a difference? Generally, you speaking. know, yeah. Um, I, again, I I think for me personally, one of the most amazing things about the, the NEIC is typically when you know we have all, all of our members come in and sit around you know a table. They come from different states, different politics. Some are elected, some are appointed. But at the end of the day, they're all regulators. At the end of the day, they both they all share a common focus on their consumers and marketplaces. And you know, I I would be less than candid if I didn't say you know occasionally sort of domestic politics doesn't come into the discussion. But more often than not, you know, we're able to work past those issues and reach really good conclusions for consumers in the marketplace, which has allowed us as an organization to endure when we've seen otherwise, you know, a lot of divisiveness and politics kind of become uh, very toxic for, for other institutions. Um, you know, we work very hard and I know the officers I showed at the beginning and the officers we've had in the past recognize uh, the very unique aspect of our culture that allows us to you know, collaborate, uh, you know, if you look at our minutes from that first meeting in 1871, that was, you know, that was a concern then that somehow, you know, we would get divided and politics would be, you know, sort of interfere with just rational regulation. Um, you know, we've avoided that. We work hard every day to, to ensure that, you know, the unique nature of the NEIC is a very collaborative, consumer-focused organization indoors. Well, the last comment I'll say here from the audience, a lot of uh, thank yous uh, for kind of letting us in and, and seeing what's under the hood, the NEIC, and, and just the confidence that people are saying they have in you uh, to lead the organization <laughs> and the 600 some, you know, experts on your team. And we're lucky as an industry to have you uh, build that team for us. And we rely on it. So a lot of comments coming in around that, Mike. Oh, that's very, very kind of everybody. And again, my, my appreciation for the work they do. As I said, we recognize that uh, you all are out there uh, protecting, you know, people like me and my family. And uh, we're grateful for the work that you all do as well. So thank you. Well, listen, the hour has just flown by. And I just want to it thank has. you again. It was really, really enlightening. And we'd love to have you back and uh, maybe dig deeper on some of these topics that we just skimmed the surface on. But Mike, thank you so much for your time and your commitment to public service. No, oh, well, thank you so much, John. It's been been a great pleasure, pleasure, and look forward to joining you again. All righty, folks. Uh, thank you again. We're going to talk about the next four webinars we have coming up because they are really stellar, just like we had today, today. Uh, February fifteenth. In two weeks, we're going to hear from Dr. Levon Henry, former senior economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors. He's going to talk about his twenty twenty three economic outlook. Don't miss that. Then you just heard on March 1st, we're gonna take on chat GPT. What is it? What can it do for the insurance industry? And we have two of our data scientists at Travelers that have agreed to come on and talk about this new AI technology that could really be revolutionary for the industry. Uh, then on March 15th, we're gonna go back and talk more cyber. Uh, we have experts from CISA, which is the federal government agency that oversees all cybersecurity policy to talk about the current threat landscapes and what's going on. 
Uh, and then on March 22nd, I'm going to sit down with the Stanley Black and Decker president and CEO, Don Allen, to discuss uh, what it's like to lead a major manufacturing company in today's world with supply chain issues uh, still around. Uh, but he's navigated uh, that beautifully for that company and just getting under the hood there and lessons in leadership. So registration is open. Uh, we invite you to uh, join us and we're thrilled to have uh, so many of you join us today. So as always, give us your feedback. We read every single comment. So we'd love to know what you wanna see from us in the next six months or so. Take care, my friends. Have a great afternoon and we're gonna see you in two weeks.